So from that one month of production of creating this live show, we then were able to create, you know, really months worth of content, uh, all bite-sized and snackable and, and, and ready to go for every platform. Hey, my name is Felix Tia, and I'm the host of Shopify Masters, a weekly podcast powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. Each week, we invite entrepreneurs like you to share what they've learned growing successful e-commerce businesses. In this episode, you'll learn what is pillar content and how it can allow you to create content specific for each social media platform, how to put on an online festival for your business, and how focusing on B2B customers can improve your product for all types of customers. Today, I'm joined by Max and Banks from Kitbash 3D. Kitbash 3D designs premium 3D model kits with everything you need to create immersive digital environments. And we started in 2017 and based out of Los Angeles, California. Welcome, guys. Hey, Felix. Thanks for having us. Hey, Felix. Hey, what's going on? So obviously a unique product just based on the very short description I gave so far. Can you explain a little bit more about the particular problem that you are solving with your products? Sure. You know, for for us, we're, we're we come from a, a long career in the film industry and in the video game industry. And uh, what we've seen is more and more virtual worlds being created, not just by large studios, but also um, from an amazing kind of a uh, growing group of digital artists around the world. Um, as 3D tools become more and more accessible, uh, one of the, the pain points is just how much you have to build and how long it takes before you actually get to see it, an immersive world or get to play around in a level of a game. Um, so for us, one of the big things was just creating this uh, ever-expanding library of uh, amazing 3D assets so that you could build any world in your imagination um, and to do it quickly and to be able to do it at the quality of the top studios in the world. So essentially, just to add to that, what that that is, if you're not familiar with visual effects, are virtual Legos that you could then create an environment in a movie or video game. Got it. So how long does like um, a typical a customer of yours, how long does it take them normally? How much can you fast track it with your products? Sure. I mean, to create something from scratch in 3D, to create like a, a final image could take anywhere from, you know, two weeks to several months. And with our products, you can do it in a day. That's amazing. I can only, I think this is not the, the exact kind of parallel, but the, the only thing that comes to my mind is similar. It's kind of like stock footage for like filmmakers that are, you know, building or kind of buying basically footage to help build out their, their film and kind of helping to build the framework around that. I think yours is obviously a lot more, more, more involved and much more uh, harder to, 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 to accomplish, but that's the only way that I can kind of conceptualize it in my mind. So are there existing competitors in this space already? Well, Felix, um, you're you're absolutely right in the stock footage kind of business model for us. That's very similar to what we're trying to accomplish. You know, in in the movie industry, it's very often that they'll build in virtual space a a backlot of New York or a Black Hawk helicopter or something like that, um, and then for that particular project, and then they'll archive that, and then they won't be able to access that those assets again. So then on the very next project, when they inevitably have to build that same environment, they have to do it all the way over again mm -hmm. from scratch. Um, so we uh, have, you know, aimed to, to give access to um, those kind of sets over and over again. Um, and as far as competitors for us, there are, um, there are other marketplaces for 3D assets. Um, generally, what they are, though, are open marketplaces. And what we are is a very closed and premium level of market space. Yeah, right, right now in the open marketplaces, anyone can build something in 3D and, and upload it and sell it on that store, similar to something like an app store. Um, for us, the big differentiator and what we wanted to do was get the best artists in the world to build our assets, to build them to the specifications that you would need for a giant film. Um, and to make sure that we have a very high level of quality control, knowing that if you're using it on, uh, you know, a Batman film, the same assets that you're using on that film is also what's available to a hobbyist digital artist. And are you so? Are you creating the the platform, or are you also a I guess like a, a publisher or or both? Like how would you can kind of 
place yourself in this kind of market? Sure. So all of our products are actually built internally by our team. Um, so we're we're not an open platform. Um, for us, it was very important to differentiate us ourselves that way, and understand that like every product that we put out is something that we've created and that we've art directed and that we've checked and QC'd and built to a very very high level of specifications. We've we've never used this analogy before, but as we're we're talking about this and thinking about your audience, um, it it might be simple to think of it more like HBO as opposed to YouTube. Mm, got it. Why was this important approach for you guys going with a, a premium closed, uh, uh, I guess, uh, approach rather than like the open market where anyone can kind of upload whatever they want? Like, what made you go with this route? Well, Max's background, you know, is a, a decade in special effects movies. He was, you know, working on Iron Man at eighteen, and has worked on Far Cry and Halo and the video game worlds and Game of Thrones and just about everything you can imagine there. And as a what's called a digital matte painter, where he is painting backgrounds, he found that this was the kind of product that was missing in his workflow, and that there mm-hmm. on these open platforms there was no quality standard, there was no consistency of of the actual quality of the models. And we could talk a lot about technical specs of the models, but there wasn't anything that that fit into um, that premium level of things that could work on the highest profile AAA games and movies. Got it. So it's closed and you guys are all working on this internally, but it sounds like a pretty labor intensive process to create these, these kits. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like what goes into like How does walk us through the kind of like the design uh, approach towards like a new project that you guys want to work on? Sure. So um, for us, we release a, a new kit every month. Um, and so it's pretty much a, a whole new world that we're designing and building. Um, and for that, you know, we have a, an amazing team of designers. So we we come up with the concept of saying, hey, we want to do something like Utopia. Um, and when we're designing a utopian world, we bring we put together kind of a mood board of, of what we think that world should look like or what we want people to be able to create with this kit. And that's kind of the goal. And then we give that to a designer who um, usually quickly sketches a bunch of designs of different buildings and parts and pieces that you might need to create those worlds. Um, from there, we give it to a 3D modeler who takes those designs and translates them into 3D space, uh, almost like a sculptor, um, really sculpts those things into these beautiful 3D models. And then from there, we have kind of the back and forth technical process of making sure that uh, in terms of specifications, uh, a, a lot of the more nitty gritty things are taken care of, of making sure that uh, the scale of every building is the same. So if you were to put an actor next to one building and next to another, the doors are all the same height or uh, the glass has thickness to get the nice reflections out of it. All those little things. And, and that's a pretty um, intensive process of, of QCing and making sure that these models are ready to go for uh, a large studio. So you mentioned a, a team of designers works on this and designers, you know, aren't cheap and a team is, can, I can imagine gets expensive quickly. Can you say more about how someone out there that, that might be in a similar situation or wants to go down the same path where they need a bunch of kind of creative and technical help, how can they get started? Like how can they structure their business to get started and then scale up like the way that you guys have been able to do? Sure. You know, it's a very unique thing I think for our product is you know, we have a long history in this industry and in this community. Um, so for us, I, I feel like uh, it's a very difficult thing to be able to reach those types of artists. And we work with artists all over the world in many, many different countries because we are always hunting to find the best artists. Uh, and that's really paramount to our business model. Um, for us, there is no quick solution to recruiting. Um, for us, it really is a lot of uh, brute force of going to different countries, of going to different art events to go meet different artists from everywhere, um, and and starting to test and and do small projects with them, and then uh, give them more and more work once we find someone who really hits that excellence bar. And I think to add to that, um, probably for a lot of your audience here, Felix, they're not in the visual effects space, but they're entrepreneurs who are are starting out and trying to to get people to help them on the product side. And a huge part of our model is using remote freelancers, as Max was just talking about. And I think there's a, a wonderful time today that there are many, many 
job forums online. Um, you can have video chats with your employees. I mean, we have we have full time employees who don't work in the office with us, um, and we just have regular video meetings. I mean, we go most of our days now are video chat to video chat, um, and so it's it's a really incredible time in technolo- technological history to to get to have a global business from a laptop. Um, so I think for a lot of people out there who are just getting into the space. Um, Hiring remote freelancers, one one part that's very specific to our model is we look for um, people similar to us who had had long, you know, decade long or more careers in an, in their space working for a big company who have been shot out on their own. So we look for very highly skilled remote freelancers, um, not rather than paying a huge company where you're paying for a lot of their uh, business infrastructure and, and advertising, and then you usually get sold by a, a, a senior player there who then passes you off to to a junior account manager. Um, we look for the senior players who have left and are now out on their own. Mm. Are there, I, th- I think, I, I'm assuming a big part of your ability to attract this kind of talent is that they believe in the vision, where you guys are going, like how do you kind of explain yourselves to the, the people that you are looking to recruit? Well, we have a, a, a very, very strong mission and and we're all pretty dedicated to this idea of the mission of Kitbash is to enable and inspire artists. And with a company with that mission to bring on the best artists, um, it's really this this idea of contribution of you've had your career as an artist and we want to continue to uh, grow as artists, but we also want to contribute to the artist community and help people be able to create these amazing things. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to branding and the amount of effort that we put into our brand of making sure that that our mission is understood by the community at large. And I think there, you know, it's it's felt by the community. This is a, a specifically tight knit community. Um, so oftentimes when when we reach out to people, they're quite familiar with with our product or, um, you know, we have some of the top artists reaching out to us because they want to as Max was saying, be part of contributing to a larger message. You know, you can spend a year or sometimes three or four years on a singular project um, or working on a, you know, Kipash 3D right. asset, you might get to influence hundreds of projects um, in that same time period. Can you give us an idea of the scale of the production for like, so you mentioned that you, you release a kit every month. Like how many people are working on a given kit and when you, that you're releasing monthly? Usually we have between five and 10 kits in production at a time. Um, these kits take a, a variety amount of time because we do work with a lot of remote freelancers and some of them are doing this uh, part time where they're working on actual games and films that are being released as well. Um, for us, the idea of having enough in production and to allow the flexibility of someone who is a top player in this space and wants to do this. Um, it's really important for us to be able to give that type of flexibility. Uh, on a given kit, we have probably four people touching it, and the average amount of time to create a kit is about four months. Mm. When you are hiring someone to build essentially intellectual property, what do you need to be aware of, either from the legal side or how you you kind of write up the contracts when you're working with these these freelancers? Like, what what kind of what sort of things do you tend to uh, make sure to focus on when you are engaging a new uh, a new hire? You mean beyond beyond their artistic prowess? Yeah, well, just like if you are to hire someone to to create these, to work on these kits and they're working, you know, part-time, they're doing something else on in their, in their, I guess, you know, quote unquote day job. Do you need to structure like some kind of contract or something? Like how do, what do you need to be aware of legally when you're hiring someone to, to, to work on this type of uh, product for you? For certain. I mean, uh, contracts and, and, you know, our product is license based as well. So, we work very closely with our legal team. Um, and we've, we worked with three or four different groups. Um, and finally found the ones that we, we really connected with who, who spoke the same language as us and, and thought about, uh, the legal aspects of it, like a business. Um, I think it's very, it's very common to find people who are very, very good at what they do, but have, uh, a struggle seeing larger picture and how things can fit in. They can do exactly what you tell them to do um, while failing to see 
um, how that fits in or how they could have performed it better knowing what they know. And so for us, finding the right um, partners on on operations side is is often about that because we use so many freelancers and remote uh, teammates having someone who is thinking about the business first um, and then how their particular department fits into that was very important in, in teaming up with our legal team. Um, mm. That being said, you know, we've done many drafts of, of all of our contracts and we have we have some pretty lengthy discussions about um, what the ins and outs are, are um, to to make work for higher contracts that fit into our particular business model. I think when you're dealing with with artists and you get into uh, contracts and, and legal stuff, it can be really intimidating uh, for for both ends um, and uncomfortable almost. And for us, I think um, being transparent and being easy to understand is the most important thing for us when we go down these journeys. Um, we try to take care of all the business stuff first so then we can have fun and jump into the creative stuff knowing that we've dotted all our I's and crossed our T's. Um, but also not, you know, sending over a 50 page contract that's all in legal jargon. Uh, it's not going to help anyone to understand what that actually means. And it's almost, uh, counterproductive if for our, for an example to that, our, for our artists contracts, our lawyers have done something we thought was awesome. We didn't ask them to do this, but for the contracts that are going to specifically to artists, not to, you know, business sides of movie studios, they um they write after each point they write a paragraph and you know translate it essentially to just help the artist understand exactly what the thing above is saying got it so you mentioned that there are a bunch of people working on like you know 10 kits at, at one time how do you guys decide what kit you should work on for 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 which kits you should be working on for for a given month yeah, I think for for us, you know, our, we keep telling our, our one of our big missions is to build the universe. We want to build everything and anything anyone needs. Um, so a big part of it is making sure that we have variety. Um, another big part of it is things that get us excited to create. Um, because you know we're serving artists, we need to create products that get them excited to go and build something. Uh, so a lot of it is coming up with variety. A lot of it is things that excite us. And the other part of it is really looking at what are the genre trends happening right now? Um, is this a big sci-fi year? Is this a big fantasy year? Um, what are the things that are missing in this marketplace? And uh, and for us, we feel like we have uh, unlimited ideas of kits. And it's really just about the timing and releases of when we, uh, when we feel it's a good, appropriate window for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, release programming. Um, and product programming has been is one of the most fun meetings I think we have because it's where we get to imagine so much. And we're very specific about having weekly meetings with each of our departments. Um, and we put our product meeting first thing on Monday. Um, and doing that every week is a, a really exciting, fun time for us to get to begin the week in, you know, our purest creative places. And as Max was saying, you know, listening to the marketplace is of paramount importance. You know, that it's it's one thing to to make a product, but if you make a product no one wants, um, you haven't you haven't found yourself in a in a great place. So we we do a lot of surveying to our audience. We we also have a live show where we interact with our audiences. We've been doing that. Uh, we've, we've we've done that almost seventy weeks in a row, um, where we audience members can can come on and and tell us what they want. Um, we also do a lot of. Um, customer experience calls where we connect directly with our B2C clients. And then we, of course, do a lot of um, B2B lunches and coffees and try to really understand where demand is heading um, so that we can stay on top of it and bring the most value to uh, those that we serve. When you when you are doing a survey, like what do, what exactly are you asking? Like, what are you looking to get answers? Uh, what, what, do you look, what kind of answers are you looking for? Sure. So customer experience is, uh, is one of the most important departments for us. Um, the, the biggest thing for, for customer experience in, in our mind is, is not necessarily knowing demographics of our customers. It's more about knowing the philosophy, the, the wants and desires and who they are as a person, uh, what their goals are as a person. Um, do they have goals as a as a professional in their career, or do they have uh, goals as a as a hobbyist and and in their own you know pure artistic pursuits? 
So we, we, we do phone calls every day with, with different customers that we have or uh, users and, and also being able to chat with them live and develop relationships with them on, on our Twitch show. Things like that, uh, it's, it's almost not about, hey, here's the 10 questions that we send to them. It's more about really developing a one-on-one relationship with as many users as possible. Uh, and from that, we can start to make some really educated guesses and assumptions um, as to what kind of products they might want in the future or what other kind of resources can we provide them that aren't our products what kind of education or training or shows or uh, contests or anything else that we can do for the actual community that isn't part of our product, uh, but further goes to support the wants and desires of our of our users. I think that is so, so important for um, what we've found and what we believe in here. You know, we are mission first entirely and product is is, is third um, in in our in our daily focus, you know, we want to serve our customer first and knowing them and being part of that community, which we've come up through, um, is why we're doing this. And then there, we just happen to, to make these kinds of products this way. And and that will continue to evolve. But the, the people in the community that we are, um, engaged with and so fortunate to be a part of is the real enthusiastic joy of this. Right. So you said that you want to serve the customer first. I think what you, I think what I'm getting at, or what I'm hearing is that that means that it could be creating free content like your show, which we'll get into in a bit, and not always around creating the latest products. Completely. You know, we we really believe give more than you ask, um, and for us, the the product and us putting out products and and our our users buying those products supports us to be able to do everything else that we want to do. Um, but you know, education and training and inspiration and all of these different other aspects that we can provide are things that we do for free um, as a way to support the community. Now, you mentioned that there are these B two B customers and also your B two C customers. Can you talk about their needs and how they're different? Totally. Um, we we segment our our customers into several different buckets, and those those are evolving as we um, as we grow. Um, but we have a, a lot of hobbyists, people who understand 3D software, who might work in an industrial side of things, who in their free time want to build a castle with a dragon flying around it. Um, we have a lot of freelance artists who will work from home or on their own um, and freelance with a studio on on particular types of projects. Um, and they can be you know, art directors or motion graphics designers or concept artists. Um, and then we have, uh, a large group of students, um, that we, we look to serve in, in different ways and helping them get into the space. Um, and we do a lot of free content like, uh, you were talking about. We also give, give away a lot of, um, sample kits and we do different programs. Um, we have some new exciting educational programs, uh, coming up this year. We work very closely with a lot of the schools. Um, and then there are the big the big studio clients, you know, the, that are making the biggest movies and games out there. Um, and we work very closely with them, uh, largely, well, because, because we've, we've serviced their needs, um, first and foremost, but also, um, you know, it's the world that we've come from. Um, and it's, it's those kinds of projects that, uh, that really gravitate towards, uh, faster workflows. You know, in the same way hobbies do as well. Yeah, I, I think one of the big things for us is it, it really is serving two very different types of things when you go B2B versus B2C. Um, for our B2B clients, they have a lot more specific requirements of, of how our products are going to fit within their overall business structure. Um, and for us, we know if we get that right and we work closely with them to make sure that we're fulfilling all of their needs – then when we turn around and give that product to a B2C customer, they're now on the same playing field, that they know what the large studios are using, and they now have access to the same tools as a, as a major studio. Um, so both are very important. Also, you know, large studios are made up of individual artists. And so by serving B2C uh, and really getting in the hands of individual artists, those artists are going to go to work one day and say, hey, this project that just came up, I know the perfect tool for this. And then we're going to get connected into that B2B realm. Just like when we do a big project with a B2B studio that gets advertised, a bunch of you know 
individual users are going to say, I want the same thing uh, that they used for that film. So it's really cyclical. It's a, it's a giant circle that we need to be hitting both of them. They both have different wants and desires, but they both feed into each other. Right. And it sounds like the if you can focus on the big studios, like the kind of B2B customers, they can, they're the ones that, it sounds like what you're saying is that they're most in tune with the direction that the market is going because there's, there's such, you know, kind of giant players in the space and they are helping you determine which direction to go and also the, almost like the quality that that's required, which then of course the B2C customers also benefit from because the standard is that much higher because again, it's, it's something that a big studio demands. Now you mentioned that um, a lot of what you're doing is creating content. So talk to us more about that. Like what are some of the the key focuses for your business? Like what, what are some certain things that you guys always wanted to be doing in terms of content creation? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, User-generated content, it, it's a terrifically exciting time in, in visual effects and in, in technology in general where um, individuals um, can start making things that, that, that resemble the things you go to the movie theater for. And there is such an exciting explosion of digital distribution in, in all kinds of media. Um, and social media is, is you know, the, the biggest driver of that, I think. And so what we've, we've done, I guess, a number of different things where we created a festival, which we can talk about um, after, um, that was servicing uh, or creating a stage for the, the top visual effects artists out there. Um, and in conjunction with that, we created what's called the hashtag KB3D contest. Um, and with that, we give out a free sample kit um, every quarter. And anyone who uses that sample kit or the, the full kit from that piece can then make um, and publish to their own page using the, the hashtag. Um, and then we do a, a big celebration of that on our live show where we make a, a trailer highlighting all the, the artists who worked on it. And then we, we give out awards to the top 10. And we usually have artists from our festival be our blue ribbon panel to vote on that. And today we've had... You know, thousands of entries and, and artists in, you know, in nearly 100 countries. Yeah. So with that, basically, we've, we've created this amazing loop of here's the sample kit. We're going to do a contest around this theme. Uh, artists all over the world are posting to their own Instagrams, but they're using our hashtag. Uh, the amount of user generated content that that creates um, feeds our social media. It gives us the ability to be able to spotlight all these different artists uh, either on our social media or our live show. Um, and it fills up social media with images that are really engaging. And then when people look at those images, they can see that they were made with Kitbash. Which which um, platform has been the most successful for you in terms of social media platforms? Uh, well, well I, I think, you know, you got to thank Instagram because we are such a, a visual uh, medium and product. Um, you know, but YouTube and Facebook and... Um, and uh, Twitch... And then ArtStation is also one of the, or is the king of, of our space. Um, and so using, using all those platforms as much as we can is, has been uh, a, massive, a massive driver for us, syndicating across platforms and creating content that's native to each platform, I think is really important for us. Yes. Yeah, say, say more about this. You mentioned syndication versus native content. How do you decide which one you should be focusing on? What, what should you be creating kind of content that's general enough that can be spread across all these platforms or creating, you know, again, native content? How do you decide which one to focus on? I think it's a really great question, Felix. I also think it's a really exciting time to be having this conversation. Um, I think it first has to depend upon what kind of in-house production capabilities do you have? If you have one person um, you know, doing your social media who's also cutting your videos, who also happens to be running your company, um, then then you want to be thinking about um, syndication and, and spreading content and making you know, the best thing for that one platform that works for you. Um, but a huge part of our business model, because we come from production, is we've created an in-house agency and production company. Um, and so we create... Um, we create content that we call a, a pillar piece that is pr usually a long form piece um, spotlighting something in particular. And then from that, we cut smaller pieces from it that can go to all the different platforms. So for our blog and for our YouTube, we put, you know, hour long 90 minute pieces on there. 
Um, but then for Facebook, we're cutting one, one to three minute videos that can run natively to that platform. And then on Instagram, we're cutting um, uh, 15 second videos, which also have a different aspect ratio. Sometimes we cut nine by 16 tall videos for um, Instagram stories. Um, so we're, we're looking to take one piece of production, being production the most time intensive thing for the largest amount of people. Um, and then, and then utilize a lot of the, the tools that are in post and distribution now to take that one piece and stretch it into a bunch of different ways that feels native to each platform. I see. So rather than just getting on YouTube and then creating a, a specific video for YouTube or a specific video for Facebook, you're creating this pillar content, this content that's essentially going to be, uh, used as the raw materials to produce the, the more native content for each of these platforms. So if for someone that is thinking about taking this approach, do you have to go into the creation of the pillar content with anything in mind to make sure that you can ultimately craft like a native content piece for each of these platforms? Completely. I, one of, you know, we, we, we did a commercial last year with our good friend, Sava who's a director on the, on the destiny cinematics. Um, and he created this beautiful three minute piece for us. Um, but one of the things with that piece was making sure that it was told in a way that could be split up into minute long pieces, 30 second pieces, 15 second pieces. And it's a pretty uh, difficult requirement, and it requires quite a lot of skill to be able to craft a, a narrative that is told in chunks that can be split out. Um, on top of that, when you're filming something, especially in 3D, um, making sure that all of your shots and compositions work for 16 by 9, if you were going to watch it on YouTube, one-to-one -one for a Facebook post, or, nine, or, or reversing that and creating a vertical piece for Instagram, um, it requires quite a bit of design uh, creativity to be able to make a single piece that can work in every different aspect ratio. Um, and then taking it even further, last fall we did, we partnered with Amazon and Twitch and did a festival, which was 12 episodes of some of the best top uh, art directors, you know, art director of Star Wars, art director of Titanfall, uh, all of these big films and games. And we would do a live stream on Twitch where we'd interview them. They'd build a world with these kits. And uh, and we did a two-hour show twice a week. And then from that um, cut, you know, we have the full-length one. That became our pillar. Each episode became our pillar. And then we would cut three-minute videos. We would cut 15-second videos, one-minute videos, and in every aspect ratio. So from that one month of production of creating this live show, we then were able to create, you know, really months worth of content, uh, all bite-sized and snackable and, and, and ready to go for every platform. And Felix, you know, we, to Max's point, you know, we're creating a lot of different types of content, but that comes from decade, you know, collective several decades of doing that. And so we, you know, we, that's a, a massive part of our specialty is that we can we can make a lot of different things, but we do a ton of testing. Um, and when you're when you're asking you know, what do we go into these types of things thinking about, uh, it's first you know, what does the audience want, and what what kind of things um, will bring value to these person these people's lives, and where are the things that that they need to know, um, and finding as many access points to that. Um, it helps us segment our, our shows and then we do a ton of, of feedback. You know, we do a lot of A-B testing um, and try to understand exactly what kind of content plays uh, to our audiences. Can, can you give an example of something that you guys have worked on recently uh, that, that and walk us through the, the decision making behind those questions that you just asked about, like, what, what, what do they want? Like, what will bring them value? Do you have an example of something recently that, that you can walk through? Sure. I mean, because, you know, because we, uh, we take C uh, customer experience or CX, as we call it, um, so seriously, and we're jumping on calls all the time, we get a lot of feedback really fast. And over the last two months, a big part of this has been talking about uh, on our show, do you like when you get a demo of how to build something? Do you like when you get an interview? Do you like something more inspirational or more educational? Uh, what types of that type of content um, are you enjoying or do you want more of from us? And we have that conversation daily with different people. 
Um, and that's some of the most important feedback we get so that every time we do a show or uh, release a new piece of content, we can kind of tailor that around what we're hearing. Um, and so we, every time we release a product, we get a great artist to do the cover. They're the first ones to get to touch the kit. We make a big event out of it. We let it spotlight that artist. So last week we released, a, no, this week, we released a new kit, uh, Ancient Temples. And from what we heard, uh, we brought in, the, the cover artist was the art director from Assassin's Creed. He came on and did uh, an hour-long show with us. And uh, what, what we heard was people really want to know how uh, these artists got into the industry or how they got their start. That was something that we heard continuously. So a big focus of our show right away after hearing that feedback was really going into what is the process of how did you get your start and showing some of your older work that isn't as pretty, um, doing the interview side of that before jumping into the actual breakdown and the making of how did you make this cover and what's the educational part of this uh, of you really explaining your workflow and process. And I think there's, you know, probably for a lot of your listeners out there too, Felix, there. Um, they may have a product or an audience base that that may not know what kind of content they want. Um, that's not so baked in um, like our segment is. Um, but I, I like to to think of it this way. And we talk a lot um, internally about who do um, each of our buckets want to be and what do they aspire to do and what are their goals and being incredibly goal oriented as, as a team and as individuals here, it's a foundational part of our principles we like to to try and do goal workshops for our our buckets and think about if they if you are a student at this point in your learning career and you want to go work for you know you want to go work on star wars what are the steps in between that and then we try to help them along the way and if we can't do it we try to find the people who can and generate content around that so that when the audience member sees it they think oh this is the kind of thing i needed and perhaps they don't even know before they see it, that this was the thing that will help them um, put the key in the lock for the next step of their career. And so driving our our mission around our content is usually to, to help bring value to that person. It doesn't, you know, product shots, you know, or product videos mm -hmm. play well, especially in, you know, retarget kind of land. Um, but that's not at the core mission of what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people grow as artists and we're trying to help people fulfill their dreams. And we just so happen to make products that help them do that. Um, but at the, at the base level, we're looking for how do we ignite that special passion that makes you want to do this sort of thing? Um, and how do we help you progress along that path? Right. I think one important thing that, that you're also saying here is that you yourself, you don't need to know all the answers, but as a, as a company, as maybe a brand that, that's out there, you probably have way more connections and access to the information than your customers. And you don't yourself have to know the answers, but you can certainly bring on people, like in your example, bring on people, interview them and have them share their knowledge, which is very similar to you know, the model that we have with the podcast that you guys have come on sharing your knowledge from you know different industries. So I think that it's an important thing to note that when it comes to content creation, you don't have to be the sole person in your head creating all the content you can kind of be a conduit and be the organizer essentially of the information that you that will bring value to your customers oh, which i just want to add to your point there felix that you know this is one of the great things of our age is you know minimum viable products and i think we in the past you had to bring a fully baked idea um, to market but nowadays especially with the way content distribution is i mean on your instagram you can post to, you know, if you have a business profile on Instagram, you can post and get real time or, or darn near real time analytics on how that post performed. And then you can compare it to the rest of the content that you put out. And it costs you virtually nothing to get some that kind mm -hmm. of feedback in a way that 15 years ago, you would have had to pay a ton of money for. Um, so we're in this great time that, you know, in this innovative world, it's very hard to predict disruption. And I think that being in the space and having consistent placement in a space and bringing value in different ways has proven over time that when disruption cracks, you'll be there for it. And there's there's a very you know it's it's almost impossible to predict what those moments are. Um, you know, for an example of that is when we put out our first batch of kits, we all took a guess at what we thought would be the top selling kit, and none of us picked the one that is overwhelmingly the best. 
Now I want to talk a little about this this festival. So you mentioned earlier the Kit Bash 3D Festival. Was this like a in person festival? Was it online? Like what was the the, the uh, what, what, to explain a little bit more about this festival? Sure. Yeah. We um you know we've we've done this now twice, um and it is there's something incredibly exciting happening in the uh, traditionally in the video game space, which is live streaming, um, where we've come from this decade of YouTube, where if you're a kid who's you know 17 years old today, you grew up watching YouTube. And now we're into a live streaming era where um, it's not edited content. It's just straight to um, to the the source and the audience is there interacting in real time with the actual piece. So we found live streaming to be one of the most exciting platforms for us um, because of how fast we can get that kind of feedback that we were just talking about, but also how, how intimate we can um, uh, iterate, how fast we can iterate content so that we can make something in real time without having to edit it um, and, and be with the audience. And then we can then take it, edit it for other platforms that appreciate um, shorter form edited content. So our festival, um, is live streamed on Twitch. Um, we've worked in the past also with Mixer. Um, we think there's some, some really exciting things happening in that space. So we do, we build a a studio set, um, and then we bring on our guests each night and then we do a, a live two hour show where we have, um, a technical director live switching between our, our multiple cameras. And we have, um, we have a great team around that in a, a real sort of mini live TV show atmosphere. Yeah, almost like Sports Center. Um, it, it's like Sports Center for art. It's, yeah, Sports Center with with a, a piece of like actually building the world of playing the game. Yeah, and you get to see a, a live piece that that oftentimes the audience gets to interact with. And this particular festival that we we just did, we partnered, as Max was saying, with Amazon and Twitch to for their Bob Ross Festival, which is to date, one of the most watched live stream festivals that they do every year um, around uh, around Bob Ross's birthday in November, and so <laughs> we did yeah, uh, yeah we did a show with them. We did that. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, I lost my train of thought, but here it was um, we had uh, you know Max was painting a painting, and and the audience wanted um, wanted to throw in in real time Bob Ross references. And so you know a, a little tree or a hidden tree is or cabins are you know essential to that platform and people got super excited about influencing Max's painting as he was doing it in real time. Yeah, it was as they would call things out, I would paint them in uh, live. So in the chat, you could say, you know, add a little happy tree over there and I'd paint a little happy tree over there. And it was it was a really cool, um, you know, interactive way to get people excited about art and kit bash and uh, and every everything in this space. How, how do you promote something like this? Like, well, if you want to put on an online festival, I think one thing to note too is that obviously it sounds like yours was pretty elaborate. You guys have a lot of work you put into it, but I'm sure someone else out there can put on something in their own industry that doesn't have to be as involved. But once you do want to go on this path of putting on a festival and you know live stream it, how do you promote it? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things here. First of all, I when it comes to live streaming, I highly recommend it to just about anyone who's building a brand um, to be able to connect with your customers, regardless of the industry that you're in, uh, in some sort of live way. Uh, for us, it started out as doing product launches. Every time we'd launch a product, we would uh, go on on Twitch and we would do a little our thing with our with our community and say, hey, we just released this. We're going to show it off. We're going to talk to you guys about this. Um, and, and being able to do that just makes you so connected with them and gives them a place uh, to be able to give their feedback to you and to actually start to build a relationship with a with a human being behind a brand, not just a logo. Um, from there to, to, to build on doing something larger like a festival, you know, for us, one of the big things with our first festival was going and getting the best artists in the world to be a part of it. Um, to get people that got that, that made it exciting. And once we had a great roster of people, really spreading that through social media and them spreading it through their channels um, was was more than enough to really get get that off the ground for our first festival. And I think it's key to think about where your audience is. You know, for us, a, a large portion of our audience, you know, is on Twitch, loves video games. Um, 
So for, for us, that was a very natural platform, but just about every social platform has live streaming features today. You can live stream on Facebook or YouTube um, or even Instagram. And I think knowing knowing where your your audience already is and then going to them and serving content to them in that kind of way is is the key. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if, if you're, if you're just getting started and you, um, you don't, you don't have marketing budgets, um, social media is free. If you hustle, um, you have to, you, you know, you can, you can reach anyone you want on any of those platforms. Um, you can engage with them. You can follow hashtags. You can comment, you can find the right targeted people for your specific product. If you have the hustle, it just takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of, a lot of thumb grease um but uh if you if you do that you got it and then if, if you have the budgets you know facebook ads and facebook ads are, are one of the most undervalued things in the marketplace um and then finding other collaborative partnerships is a massive part of of what we're doing is is teaming up with people like twitch who have um the same goal in mind um where we both just derive different value from creating a product together so when you are put pushing out a, a festival, like what what are some what are what are, what do people value? What are people looking for that that makes them want to come and tune? And like how do you advertise it? What kind of what kind of benefits do you advertise to your your audience? Well, our specific product is about access, um, and we make a product that is for the best at what they do in the world, and so finding the best at what they do in the world and getting them on our show um, is you know, integral to that. And with, with these guys, I think there's a really interesting part of visual effects that in a credits of a movie, they're often credited far down at the bottom, if credited at all. And credits are, are a huge issue in the industry. And so creating a stage for the best world builders out there to be seen and to be recognized and celebrated for the great work they're doing was something that we thought we could take our particular skills and provide that value to our um, our guests on the show. And so we found how do we how do we help the best at what they do do it more, do it better, be celebrated or connect and 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 give back and reach a younger audience and help other people who are are trying to get into the space and may not know how, how do we give them that stage or platform? So mm -hmm. we first thought, okay, how do we bring value to the guests? And then now that we have the guests, how do we bring value with the guests to the audience? Got it. What's coordination like for something like this? Because you're bringing on lots of very important people that I'm sure they're super busy and getting them all to such a come on at a very short time window. How did you guys coordinate this? You know, I, I think for us, infrastructure is is really important to our business in just about every way. Uh, the same sort of coordination it takes to have artists in you know ten different countries working on the same product um, is is the same sort of infrastructure you need to get a bunch of different artists in the same place at the same time. Um, and so for for us, I think a lot of that comes down to our production experience, but also just being very communicative, very organized using tools like Asana and Discord, um, all these different third-party platforms that allow us to streamline our communications and streamline our organization to be able to do uh, a, a lot of very complex things with a lot of different people uh, in a very coordinated way. Got it. So you mentioned uh, Asana and Discord. What other kind of apps or services do you guys use to help run the business? Yeah, Discord is a really important one for us. Uh, we use that for communication but we use it for a lot of things, but we use it for communication within our internal team. We also use it for communication with our community. Um, our community actually set up a Discord uh, and, and it's community run for Kitbash. And uh, we pop in there to see what's going on and be able to talk with people directly. Uh, and then we have our own private channel of, um, you know, everything that we're working on and coordinating with different artists or different events or marketing or customer experience and all of that. Um, we use uh, Asana for project management um, that really helps us organize all the tasks and the calendar and the timeline, especially when you're talking about this much content, because we're releasing you know, 20 pieces of content per week on five different platforms. Um, so the amount of organization that it just takes to uh, manage that, uh, Asana is pretty key to that. Um, we use HubSpot as our CRM. Uh, to be able to uh, make sure that we know what's going on uh, with our customers and that as we develop these relationships, um, we're, we're permanently uh, creating 
a, a database of, of, of knowing, you know, when is it someone's birthday and we can send them a free kit uh, or, you know, also being able to segment and understand like, hey, this group of our users are students. So being able to plan things around that. Uh, we use Emma for our email uh, newsletters, which are a very important thing for us to be able to uh, let our community know what's going on with Kitbash. Um, and of course, Shopify. Shopify is, is really key to so much of what we're doing. Um, being able to manage our store in such a, a just an easy way, but also being able to get all the data of understanding how, how kits are doing, um, how products are doing. Um, you know, and and what's our traffic? What's our what are people looking at? What 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 is of interest? Or maybe there's a, a kit that everyone's going to visit, but they're not pulling the trigger on it, uh, and maybe that's something that we discount. So all the all of those tools of Shopify are super helpful for us to make decisions. Are there any specific, specific tools that you use, or sorry, apps that you use on Shopify that you recommend? Yeah, um, we use quite a bit. We we use Blog Studio for our blog. Uh, we use bulk discount code generator. We use order printer. Uh, we use quite quite a bit of little apps and plugins in Shopify. Just usually they're, they're for a very, very specific thing that we want that functionality. Th those are kind of the main ones that I'd recommend. Awesome. So thank you so much, Max and Bang. So kitbash3d.com is a website. What's your big goal for this year? Oh, we love that question, Felix. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for us at the at the end of the year, um, Max and I kind of hold up and and get a, a real good look at our our strategy and go through what our our mission and metrics are. Um, and we have we have some pretty pretty specific goals, but I think um, I just I, I want to add to you know a, a huge part of our model is having a, a lean team enhanced by technology and using third party platforms like Shopify and and trying to automate everything. Um, or automate at least as much as we can so that we can do more with less time. And the the key to this thing, I think, was finding a mission that evoked our passion, that made us want to get up and work. Because undoubtedly, no matter how much automation you have, the the, the key ingredient is is time in and hard work. And, and all of these things, you know, keep us up at night, but it's up at night in a way that we really love. And so living living passion and mission forward um, is is sort of the key focus on on how do we how do we drive this ship you know this year and and beyond. Yeah, I think for us, um, you know, we've we've chosen some large goals that are going to take a lot longer than a year to achieve. Um, every day is just putting a step forward, and for this year, I think uh, one of our big focuses is is continuing to grow. Um, to grow Kitbash, to improve Kitbash, to improve the community, to find more and more ways that we can enable and inspire artists, um, find ways to automate what we're already doing so that we can take on even more um, and, to, and to grow in that way. And for us and our team to be happy and healthy. So we, we break down our, our process into um, what we call mission to metric alignment. And you know, st with our stated mission of to enable and inspire artists, we then think of what are the strategy and tactics we want to 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 do um, in between that, and then what are the metrics that will allow us to know if we've succeeded. And in our you know our tactics are to build the universe and to remove friction and uh, and to create the stage um, while you know fostering the community and and bringing education. Um, so if we can hit those five points and in, in as many of the things that we do, then we find we have a really good strategy fit. Awesome. Thanks again so much for coming on and sharing your experience, guys. Thank you so much, Felix. Thanks for having us. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Shopify Masters, the e-commerce podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs powered by Shopify. To get your exclusive 30-day extended trial, visit shopify.com slash masters.